So what I'm going to talk about today is kind of uh, two sort of fundamental methodological issues that we perhaps don't really talk about uh, enough uh, considering how fundamental they are to science. Uh, so I'm going to talk about two uh, R packages that uh, our colleagues are, are developing at the moment, one for visualisation of MCMC chains and one for uh, addressing reproducibility and speech distribution modelling. But first, I'll just kick, sort of kick off with if you ask someone what I do, they kind of say you do pretty visualisations and user-friendly software. And it's usually because I haven't explained myself enough about uh, uh, the design side, which is actually a really important part of science. So if they're talking about pretty visualisations, they mean something which isn't a default. It's probably unusual. It looks colourful and it looks like it took a bit of effort. And if they're talking about the user friendliness of software, they're probably talking about exactly the same things. If it's got a slider bar, then it counts as user friendly, apparently, uh, which isn't really true. But uh, what I'm really interested in is uh, designing visualizations that maximize how we can think about uh, the different topics that we're actually dealing with in science and hopefully increase the scientific productivity. And then when we're talking about software, the user friendliness actually uh, comes from designing uh, software in such a way that it maximizes how we can interact as individuals and as a community uh, in science. So uh, when we're talking about visualization systems, we actually have to think a bit about how people think and see and how that relates to what scientific tasks they're doing. And in terms of uh, the software, like how do we actually interact as individuals uh, that should be informing how we design these systems. So that's the sort of brief uh, philosophy of where I come from. Uh, so the first project I'm going to talk about is called Backfills. And uh, as I said, it's for visualizing MCMC uh, outputs. And there's lots of other uh, software and packages out there which do some great stuff. But hopefully this, uh, uh, I'll convince you that we take a bit of a different uh, route on this. And uh, just to say thanks to Remy Bardenay, Ben Calderhead, and Drew Purvis, who've uh, been involved in uh, discussing uh, this project from the outset. So uh, this is an MCMC chain. It's kind of interesting. And this is only a fraction of it. You can imagine how interesting uh, lots of these chains get when they all hang out together. Uh, so the key thing about MCMC analysis is trying to work out whether these chains have actually stabilized. So you're trying to uh, parameterize the model and you try to work out whether this is a fair representation of the distribution of a parameter. And there's lots of <coughs> ways of uh, analyzing uh, the MCMC chain. Uh, the top few are statistical uh, uh, tests, uh, well, statistical diagnostics, because nothing can tell you whether it actually really absolutely has converged. Uh, it's kind of, if you hit all these rules of thumbs, uh, then you're probably doing uh, quite a good job in your analysis. And then you have things like autocorrelation functions, which looks at how autocorrelated uh, your chain is. But then what, what happens there is you're moving from rules of thumb, which are quantitative, and you get a number and you can see how close your number is to that one, uh, to things which are a little bit more qualitative, like has it got a sharp decline? Does it look flat? Is it uh, state? Has it stabilised? And uh, uh, like Bill was saying earlier, those sort of things were like a hairy armpit or a little bit harder to deal with. And then the bit that I'm really interested in is uh, the trace plots. So if you plot the whole uh, MCMC chain in one go, what should you actually really be looking at? And when you look at the best advice in the literature, it gets quite amusing at times. But it starts off with things, uh, your MCMC chain should look well mixed or unmarkovian, uh, but then it goes down to things like it should look like a hairy caterpillar. <laughs> and that, in terms of uh, science, is a little bit weird if that's how we're supposed to train people, because like, that sort of looks like a hairy caterpillar, and that looks doesn't look like a hairy caterpillar, so maybe there's a problem there. And then we've got a colony of hairy caterpillars, which <laughs> may or may not be okay, but if we put them on that sort of plot, they look hairier than they were uh, individually. So uh, this is sort of a, uh, it seems like a small problem, but it's actually quite an interesting one to deal with. Because if we're doing hairy, 
hairy caterpillar uh, plot analysis, then we've got to kind of specify what kind of hairy caterpillar we're looking at. Uh, and actually, like when you look at some of the more detailed uh, descriptions of what your hairy caterpillar should look like, uh, like this one, your hairy caterpillar should have efficient shearing, unbiased amplification, and elimination of variation associated variation regardless of position. And I'm sure in the uh, books about hairy caterpillars, it doesn't describe them like that. So we've got a little bit of a mismatch. So what we really want are some graphics which kind of articulate some of those things that we're actually looking for, which are statistical quantities uh, rather than uh, the hairy caterpillarness of a plot. So some of the problems with looking for these sort of hairy caterpillars in your MCMC chain is that uh, the points get occluded really quickly. Once you're cramming loads, uh, well, maybe in tens of thousands of data points in a single plot, everything kind of looks a bit like a hairy caterpillar. So things which are really squashed up and use fat lines, uh, then they start looking like a hairy caterpillar. But if you stretch them out and use them uh, thin lines, then they don't actually look like that uh, that much anymore. So in our graphics, we need to account for that sort of thing. <coughs> and then also, we need to account for how long these hairy caterpillars really are going to be if you're going to have a look at them properly. So if we plot a MCMC chain with a five centimetre high graph, uh, if you use the sort of laws of visualisation that the aspect ratio should be based around a 45 degree angle for the uh, average angle of all your data, which is a bit of a boring point, but it's kind of works actually. For that five centimetre graph, you're going to be on your sort of seventh page of your journal if you want to display that graph in a way that people could actually see it. And if you want to fill it in a one column plot, then it's going to be like uh, a quarter of a centimetre high. So we need something better than these trace plots. <coughs> and what's really interesting, which I won't, it takes a little bit of explanation, but uh, it's worth reading this paper uh, by Harrison et al is that I only found out about this in November, but line plots are actually really, really rubbish for actually detecting negative correlations in the data. And they're so bad that they're actually no better than guessing and putting it down to a random chance whether a line graph, uh, whether you can detect these correlations in line graphs. And they perform really poorly. And then once I found that out, I was sort of like, right, line graphs really aren't the way to go. That's the sort of the problems with trace plots. Uh, they are associated with all other, uh, lots of other kinds of uh, visualizations and graphs which kind of inform your uh, uh, process of deciding whether your MCMC uh, chains have converged. And what we'd really like is to be able to combine a lot of these things into one kind of graph rather than be able to have to look at seven, interpret them in all different ways. Uh, we should be able to combine them in a better way. So. This is relatively simple. Well, it's very simple, actually, uh, but it works quite well. So this is my hairy caterpillar, but it's going upwards. So this is the start of my MCMC chain, and it goes up towards the end. But rather than actually try and just look at that and work out whether it's stabilized, I actually just want to look at these sort of segments of the chain, which have been defined uh, by me. Uh, and then look at the distribution and the parameters within all these plots. So these are just sort of uh, marginal plots of the distribution uh, within different segments of the uh, uh, MCMC chain. And why that works really nicely <coughs> is that if you plot all the MCMC chains uh, for, well, multiple uh, chains for the same parameter over each other, it's kind of impossible to actually get anything out of that. It's just lots of hairy caterpillars possibly mating or doing something else. <laughs> but then with our other plot, we can actually show all those distributions and we can actually look at the different convergence uh, amongst those distributions uh, for the different uh, chains for the same parameter. And we can actually make a decision based on that rather than this. Because when we look at the marginal distributions, they kind of look after the 2000th iteration of the... Uh, MCMC chain, they look like they've actually all converged. 
uh, even though some of them had a little bit of trouble, like the blue one, getting uh, uh, to converge. Uh, and then we can use this plot to ch show lots of different quantities. So this one showed the marginal distributions in each of these different <laughs> segments of the chain. Whereas, sorry, I can't see if it changed a lot. Yeah. Yeah, this one's uh, the marginals within each segment. But this shows the total uh, all the way up to that segment. So this actually starts to let you uh, inform you of uh, what your whole analysis looks like. Whereas the one previously lets you sort of make a decision of whether you want to cut your chain, which I know not everyone would agree with, and Bob will probably give me evils in a second, uh, whether you want to cut it off at a certain point. So this helps the decision-making analysis. And then you can obviously... Uh, make it look better and better uh, so it fits into a publication and your reviewers are convinced. But uh, like this simple graph, uh, I thought it was cool to start with, but then I kind of thought actually it's a really great solution because we can add all, other, all sorts of other things into this graph without making it look ridiculous. Uh, so you've got your trace and your segments, but you could also add in your running means which just is an average, or uh, and you can do a running uh, evaluation of the variation uh, uh, in the segment, in, in the chain. Yeah, you can add that in there really uh, straightforwardly. And then all those segment blocks, you can link that to real statistical diagnostics like the Goecki st uh, statistic. So then actually you can kind of get uh, four to five different things in the same plot really easily. And uh, actually, that would be uh, great. Because <coughs> when you consider, actually, in MCMC analysis, there was loads of activity on uh, statistical diagnostics in the uh, early 90s. And that kind of set the bar for a lot of the things that people use for analysis. But when it comes to visualizations, everyone's just been doing the basics for a very, very long time. So we need a little bit more uh, to help. So in backfields, there's other things that we're trying to do. So trying to help people uh, be able to see the things that they actually want to articulate when they're asking questions. So uh, I'm not going to talk about this at length, but this is basically an information dashboard for your different chains uh, that you've run uh, for different parameters. You can look at the correlation between those parameters and the joint distributions. And then we have like a simple measure called Earth, Mo uh, Earth Movers Distance that uh, is a really useful uh, statistic someone created to say what the difference between those joint distributions are. So then you can actually actually uh, start having a look at uh, if those things are ranked and the outputs spat out to you. You can actually start making decisions about what you actually need to go back and change in your model. So the visualization then becomes a lot more uh, helpful in informing uh, what's going on uh, underneath the hood that you never really see unless you uh, do some of those uh, stats and get uh, the rules of thumb numbers out. So the other thing uh, that is an end goal is that people create their graphs all the time, but then they just throw them away. And then they write in the paper, uh, our change converged and visual analysis confirmed that and everyone's supposed to accept that. But wouldn't it be great if we could actually put all this stuff into automated PDF reports that you don't necessarily have to look at yourself, but they get supplied with your paper and uh, reviewers can look at it and see whether they're convinced of the things which you say that you are. Uh, so the idea is that we can put in some uh, really informative visualizations into a single page for each uh, parameter. It wouldn't take any, uh, wouldn't really be any bother to spit that out and actually attach that in the sub information uh, for the paper. So that's it for backfills. Uh, the kind of key things uh, here is like showing what the users want to see. So talking to people who do MCMC. Uh, they don't actually really want to see the data. They want to see certain questions articulated in the right ways uh, so that they can see, uh, work out what the answer is. So they don't really want to see the data. And what we do a lot in, visual, uh, in science is 
visualise the data, we'll work out a way that we can display it all at the one time and assume that that works for the human beings, but it doesn't always. Uh, and the aim of backfields is also within the visualisations to provide context. So what is flat, what is steep, uh, actually make those things uh, uh, part of the visualisation so it's really obvious. And make those visualisations so they're worth keeping, they're worth displaying and they're worth sharing. Uh, then we don't lose all that sort of information resource uh, uh, from science. And yeah, don't forget the hairy caterpillar because uh, once you remember that story, it helps with all the other visualizations you'll do. So the other second, uh, the other project, uh, the second one is called Zoo One, and this is a bit of a flip away from uh, the visualization side, <coughs> and it's all related to species distribution modeling. So I assume that everyone has heard about species distribution modelling in some way or another, because it's basically where you're going to get some maps of species occurrence and environmental variables, use some sort of algorithm to derive uh, functions between that species occurrence and the environmental variables, so you can make some predictions. And this is an absolutely huge area of research in terms of uh, people hours, the number of people working in this area and also all the different software that they actually use. Um, it's, yeah, like if you haven't uh, come across it, it's worth having a look at because it is kind of like a scientific phenomenon in terms of uh, software enabling uh, a specific kind of analysis. So this has been hugely productive. However, it does have its problems because in terms of how we interact as scientists and as a community, uh, the sort of discourse on big questions has been fairly unproductive. So we have uh, a little to and fro in PNAS between uh, a different set of authors where they, one said that uh, we don't believe your analysis, we did it this way, uh, we found this difference, and then the original authors say uh, you must have done it differently because we did it again and it worked. And then that's end of conversation, whereas it's a fundamental principle about this science. Uh, that they're actually talking about. So because it wasn't reproducible and open, uh, we can't actually go back and investigate that anymore. Uh, the other thing is that we have inaccessible benchmarks for modelling in this area. So uh, Jane Elith and colleagues did a very high impact paper uh, like nine years ago now, but uh, where they compared lots of different methods uh, lots of different models, uh, lots of different data across different continents. But none of that data and models uh, are available. So if someone comes along with a new method, like this great one in Methods in College and Evolution, uh, they can't actually go back and cross-compare whether their model does any better. And also, we've got this huge literature then, which if you want to do a review, you can go back through all the reviews, uh, through all the papers and quantify things, but it's actually uh, really quite hard. So even just to compare the AUC uh, metrics on a load of papers, and then if anyone wants to reproduce that review, they have to go through by hand as well. So the sort of upshot of that is that research is continually uh, being created and lost in the form of software and code. And what we really need is something which is a little bit more of a community-driven enterprise where people can uh, give and share uh, different uh, parts of their models and analyses. So that's the whole idea of Zoom, so that we create a software which is able, so it's discoverable, repeatable, citable, reviewable, modifiable, etc., etc. And uh, we're aiming to do this in R. So it's quite a new ish project, as I'll explain in a minute. Um, and just to say now, like I saw this uh, tweet from yesterday, which was, so along the, someone was talking at the uh, open reproducibility workshop yesterday. Along the bottom is uh, time, and uh, up the top is, uh, on the y-axis, is awesomeness. So when you're developing the software, you kind of go along, but then once you actually get into the sort of technical issues and nitty grittiness of creating things which are open and reproducible, your awesomeness kind of goes down really quickly and it takes quite a lot of time to produce something <coughs> which is important. 
and can help people. And that's kind of mirrored on uh, us as scientists. So we need technology that can go through this uh, uh, process of investment so that we can all uh, make things uh, which are open and reproducible a little bit easier. So the demo is on my computer, so I'll talk to you about uh, some code, which is really boring, but it's really simple, and then hopefully convince you that it's kind of important. So what these three workflows are, are Z1 uh, workflows. Uh, we've got some species data in each of them. We've got some environmental data. Uh, we've got a little process step, which is needed for uh, to match the data to a specific method. And then we've got an output. And that's all the workflow is. It's those five uh, different pieces. Uh, but it's as easy as coding any other analysis, if not easier. Oops. If not easier. And then you've got a workflow. And that could be uh, named your paper. Uh, so then that's the actual uh, shareable and reproducible unit, uh, well, reproducible to some degree because it doesn't account for all different features of your hardware, but uh, there it is and you can share it. You can do things which get a little bit more complicated as well. So this workflow has got two different methods in there. It just makes uh, 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 that analysis parallel so it does all those things at the same time and you can list things as well. So that's really boring but uh, kind of important because uh, that all works. Uh, and then the other key thing is that you can create your own uh, functions to go in that workflow. So it isn't any more difficult really than wrapping around a little bit of code which says this is a new module around the function that you were writing anyway and then give it to our build module function with some information and then your module's uh, ready to use. <coughs> and that's how all the modules that we've got uh, within Z1 already have been made. So with that, so say with, like with this workflow, we've got two different methods in there. Uh, that's how we can actually build up an uh, online reproducible database uh, for speech distribution modeling, which provides benchmarks and standards to the whole community. So this is the Jane Elif paper where they've got all these different uh, uh, modeling methods with their AUC and correlation, and you can actually see uh, which models perform better than others. Uh, so we want to be able to create this sort of thing uh, as a reusable database. So like I said, it w this is a little bit of a new project. So we basically start, started with a workshop last year where we had nothing more than the logo and a general idea of the direction that we'd like to go in. And then we invited scientists to come along and we talked about uh, these uh, 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 kind of issues in lots of different ways. Uh, then we spent two hours creating a uh, code example uh, to prove that it could work. Uh, that was mainly Emil Van Loon and Nick Golding and I drank a coffee. And then uh, we got an intern called Tim Lucas uh, last summer to work for 12 weeks uh, and I can't say uh, enough about what a great job he did because basically halfway through his internship we had a user workshop where we got people to come and try the software straight away and the important thing there is that we kept people in the loop uh, who might be potential users all the way through developing uh, the software so far. So from a very small group of people, uh, like there's quite a lot of people in and around Z1 in different ways. So we've got Tim, me, Nick and Emil who are kind of like the core team. We've got people in uh, computer science, including Jeff, who you can't see, who's going to create the web repository side. Then over the far side, we've got a user panel who were sort of poised and positioned ready to help us. Uh, when we've got uh, questions and hopefully get involved in uh, the workshops that we'll do afterwards. And the important part of this was that we employed the method of user-centered design, i.e. we got the users involved at the first place, gave them some sandwiches, draw uh, lots of workflows that we analyzed a bit afterwards and got, uh, tried the software out on them really quickly, uh, uh, afterwards after a really quick period of uh, development. 
And uh, Jane Elith, we met with her in February and hopefully she's going to join the user panel as well because constructing this kind of analysis isn't uh, uh, something that you do very, uh, uh, well, you don't do naively. So that's kind of it for Zoo, Zoo One. So the sort of end uh, uh, punchline for this kind of thing is thinking that actually our code and data shouldn't really be something which supports a paper and a publication. Like it should really be an object in itself where code and data can interact with, that actually interacts with our paper. And uh, then that's how you actually create a little bit of an ecosystem of uh, uh, reproducible code and data. And the final thing is uh, a couple of thoughts. Uh, because I think uh, design doesn't really appear as a method within science enough. And quite a lot of these sort of software projects get defined by the technology rather than the user. And turning that around is uh, a little bit difficult because we're not necessarily trying to do that sort of stuff but hugely important. And that might be through interviews, workshops, and uh, actually get them involved in the development rather than going uh, into your office, creating some software, coming out, saying, isn't it wonderful? And they said, but it's yellow rather than black. And you're like, oh, God, and you have to go back. But if it's a real feature, that could be a real nightmare. And also, creating software and doing these kinds of methodological issues uh, is research in itself. We don't know what the best software is. Uh, we're constantly trying to uh, pursue it, but uh, to actually achieve that, we have to defy the uh, defaults uh, to some extent by understanding the users. So, yeah, that's it from me. I'll pitch, you with a, I'll pitch you with a question. So, I mean, one of the, well, there are a couple of, it's obviously a really, really great approach. I mean, one of the problems would be getting people to, to engage and actually use these, uh, these kind of methods so, and these kind of packages. I mean, what, what's the next stage in terms of selling? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, part of it is, like, if you've got the users involved, well, potential users from the beginning, then hopefully that process is kind of natural and you don't have to sell because it's actually built for a task that they want to do. Uh, with uh, backfills, that's probably more the case, whereas with Zoo One, it requires a, probably a different level of investment from users. So we want to do uh, a couple of workshops uh, that we got funding for to get people along uh, to test it, but also to contribute to some kind of different analysis. And then hopefully via that we can actually find out more about where we do the right things, where we do the wrong things, and produce a new piece of science and then take it from there because not all software has to be popular yeah. to succeed. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, and, and, I mean, so go back to the, the MCMC example and the, the hairy caterpillars, what well, I used to call them bog brushes, but so, <laughs> um, um, I mean, how much is the problem there is, is, is the tools that are available or how much is actually the understanding because people are actually increasingly using what's actually really quite an advanced complex tool to, you know, it's, as a black box method where yep. all sorts of things can go wrong. Yeah, uh, it's totally uh, both of those things. So, uh, like, understanding the complexity of the methods, like, even though I've done some of that modelling before, I didn't understand as much as I do now by trying to interrogate what uh, goes on with all those different areas. And, uh, uh, yeah, the sort of people side of that issue is, uh, like, General, generally down to access and being able to discover those things which are important about the models and uh, there's lots of software which kind of do the same thing with different colours and yeah. different aspect yeah. ratios but they don't really break down the problem. Great. Oh, oh Rob, uh, Rob's got a question. Thanks Craig, that was really interesting. And there's obviously a nice piece of software here which will do some really nice stuff. But the thing we know about computer science is that it's evolving all the time and in 10 years time we'll be able to do something which is even more awesome. Um, but if we've got all these sorts of um, nice little packages of data which are sort of done in this way, how do we ensure that in 20 years time people will still be able to go back to them and even f further into the future? Uh, yeah, that's a great point. And uh, I think the first step has to be encoding it in some way or another 
so that it could possibly be retrieved in the future because we are sort of standing upon 20 years of just in species distribution modeling of data and code which isn't available and uh, like what the best solution is is kind of I think it will have to be what people actually use and what can make a difference to their day-to-day -day work uh, so there are projects out there like BioVail which uh, I didn't had never heard about until we started this project uh, which can do uh, some aspects of reproducibility but I don't know anyone who uses it so that's probably a more high-end computer science techie uh, solution uh, but whether people use it or not uh, is a different matter so yeah getting it into some sort of reproducible format is an important thing and a format which people will actually use i.e. in R for this community is a big thing. So. Great. Oh, Bill's got a question. Thanks. That's terrific and really interesting. I'm sure exactly what we need. But it's just one problem. Uh, and can you, can you see how we could expand that out? What we really want is exactly the same, but for all the ecological problems we consider. Can you, can you envisage a platform or process by which we could scale this up? Yeah, because uh, one of the p things that people say is, well, you're doing it in R, so they could do that in R anyway. But by creating an R package, it puts a little bit too much of an overhead for most people to actually get involved with contributing knowledge in that sort of way. And uh, uh, sorry, I've forgotten the first part of your question. But what I wonder, <laughs> you've done it for species distribution models. For everything else. We really want to do it for it. We want it to do for sort of all ecology, all the. Yeah. Uh, so. Why we did it with species distribution modeling is uh, we're interested in that area anyway. It's kind of big enough discipline that it makes sense to make that investment. But also it is uh, part of a family of uh, different reproducible software that we're working on in 2020 science. Uh, and the idea is we have to explore this stuff to actually understand it. We have to make the projects open in terms of how we've understood how the users interact and how we've made the software uh, right for those user groups. And it's only by that that we sort of get there, because otherwise there's quite a lot of huffing and puffing in the literature and on the sort of scientific news about reproducibility, but not much that actually happens. So, yeah. 